Acts chapter 2. This is Holy Week. Some of you were with us for our Good Friday service. Jesus Christ has been rejected. Jesus Christ has been crucified. And that alongside two criminals. There is one who looked upon Jesus and saw him as accursed. There's another who looked upon Jesus and believed in him, trusted him as Savior and Lord. And there, as Jesus hung on the cross, he looked at that criminal and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. As Jesus hung upon the cross, uh, a little bit later, the Jews would come and they would ask Pilate to have the bodies taken down. They, didn't, they were okay with uh, murdering one lawlessly who was undeserving of such a death, but they would not allow the bodies to stay up during their special Passover. And so they asked Pilate whether or not the bodies could come down. Pilate agrees. Centurions go to remove the three bodies from the cross. They find when they come to Jesus that he is already dead. John tells us that prior to Jesus' death, he cried out, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up the Spirit. Then a man named Joseph of Arimathea, who up to that point seemed to be a private disciple, kind of comes out of the woodwork, and he comes to care for the body of Christ. He and Nicodemus prepare that body. They lay it in Joseph's uh, new tomb, not far from the cross. And then we're told in the book of Matthew that Mary... Magdalene and the other Mary sat opposite the tomb, and they watched all this unfold. They saw the body of Jesus, then laid in the tomb, and then the stone rolled over that tomb, according to the burial custom of the Jews. And then Matthew tells us this in Matthew 27. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this, uh, what the imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to him, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And so that's where we are. Jesus is dead. He's in the tomb. The stone is not only rolled in front of the tomb, but now Pilate and the other officials have gone and sealed the tomb so that none could be, uh, a, none would be able then to steal the body of Jesus and then come up with some fable of resurrection. And so Jesus is dead. The body is buried. The tomb is sealed. As far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, it's over. Jesus, the threat to their power and authority, is dead. The one who denounced their hypocritical, godless faith and drew people away from them is dead. As far as Pilate and the Romans are concerned, the Jews' lust for blood has been satiated and there's no longer a fear of insurrection. As far as the followers of Jesus are concerned, their teacher and their friend and all of their messianic hope is dead. The dreams of the people are crushed. Mark 16 tells us that on the first day of the week, Sunday, the disciples could be found mourning and weeping over the death and burial of Jesus. Their friend is dead, yes. Their master is dead, yes. But again, all of their hope that he was the promised one who would come and usher in the kingdom of God, that hope is crushed. Thousands upon thousands had seen and or been affected by the miracles of Jesus and by the teaching of Jesus. Many were convinced that he was the one, the son of David, the one who would come and ascend upon David's throne, the greatest prophet and the final priest and the coming king, the Messiah. But now his disciples are absolutely disheartened, despondent, hopeless. The fact is, early on in Christ's ministry, his enemies were seeking to put him to death, and now it appears they've succeeded. From an earthly perspective, the enemies have won. Christ is dead and all hope is lost. But then Sunday came. On that Sunday morning, the women, Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James and Salome, went to the tomb. And the Bible says that while, as they were journeying to the tomb in Matthew 28, behold, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. And then when the women arrived in Luke 24, verse 2, it says they found the stone rolled away. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
while they are perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. What does this mean? Stone rolled away, angels there testifying to the fact that Jesus was not there, but he's risen. What is the significance of this? Well, it means that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. It means that he did indeed perfectly fulfill the law. He did indeed suffer according to God's predetermined plan. He did indeed defeat death and sin and Satan. He did indeed rise from the dead just as he had predicted. So the women went, the first witnesses of the resurrection. By the way, isn't that awesome that the first witnesses to the resurrection are women? And uh, you see that early on Christianity was challenging some of the cultural assumptions. And so the women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. And then the Bible gives us accounts of a flurry of post-resurrection appearances. The risen Christ now appears to Mary Magdalene. Again, the first to see the risen Christ is a woman, Mary Magdalene. Then he appears to Peter, then to two despondent disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then to all the disciples minus Thomas, and then to seven disciples who were fishing, and then he appeared to 500 all at once. And those post-resurrection appearances took place over 40 days. Luke summarizes for us in Acts 1, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And some were still hanging on to the hope that this resurrected Jesus means that he's going to usher in a physical kingdom. He's going to overthrow the Romans and establish the kingdom of God on earth in that moment. But that wasn't to be the case. And so in Acts 1.4, it says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Go to Jerusalem. The physical kingdom is not now. Go to Jerusalem and wait, the resurrected Jesus says to his disciples. And so in our text this morning in Acts chapter 2, that's where we pick up. The disciples have been told by the resurrected Jesus to go to Jerusalem and to wait. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read it. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak to, uh, in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at, the sound, at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. A miracle has taken place. The Spirit has descended. And what is that miracle? Men and women spoke in such a way that all could hear that language in their own native tongue. And there we see the biblical definition of tongues. And so, uh, men and women are bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Are, are these, are, are, how is this possible? How are they speaking these languages when they're all from Galilee? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they're drunk. They're filled with new wine. God has created the perfect stage. This is Pentecost. Uh, this uh, Jew is coming from uh, every nation together to celebrate this festival. And here they are together, thousands upon thousands. And God has chosen this stage to show wonderful evidence that Jesus is alive and who has sent the Holy Spirit. And so here we see a miraculous evidence of that reality. The Jewish leaders were fearful that the disciples might steal the body of Jesus and then start a rumor that he has risen from the dead. They were concerned that that rumor, if that rumor mill got churning, then there would kind of be an urban legend that would be uh, an even greater or garner an even greater following than Jesus did during his life. 
But what does our text say? Pilate or Herod or the Jewish leaders or the centurions were absolutely powerless to stop the birth of Christianity. Christianity wasn't going to be born by the rumor of resurrection. It was going to be born by the descent of the Holy Spirit who transformed Jesus' disciples. And that's what happened. God launches his church, not with the whispers of rumors, but with the earth-shaking, miracle-producing descent of the Spirit of God. And so as Christ's opponents would soon learn, more powerful and more concerning for them would not be the rumors of resurrection, but the undeniable evidence of resurrection as seen in the newfound boldness of his disciples. Look at how Peter is immediately empowered in our text. Now remember, Peter previously was timid. Peter previously had denied Jesus. These disciples were just a few days earlier disappointed and disillusioned and depressed. But suddenly, they become joy-filled, hope-infused, passionate followers of the Son of God who proclaim the gospel with boldness. And so look in verse 14 of Acts 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, addressed to thousands of Jews gathered for Pentecost. And here's his sermon. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I shall show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon be, uh, to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Peter addresses the crowd. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. Peter continues, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Just days earlier, Peter and the other apostles, I mean, they were the castoffs. They were those who had no power, who had no authority, uh, who were weak, who were rejected uh, by those around them. Now suddenly, Peter is entertaining an audience of 3,000, emboldened by the Holy Spirit. He's preaching a sermon about the resurrected Jesus and demanding repentance from his crowd. It's absolutely stunning. 
And so this morning, we're just going to look at Peter's sermon, see what we can learn from Peter's sermon in the remaining moments we have together. So first of all, what we learn from Peter as he preaches after Christ has risen from the dead is that the resurrection of Jesus was determined by God from the beginning. Look in verse 22 and 23 of our text. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the what? Definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed. What Peter was saying is that all these things that took place over uh, the last uh, few days, though they seemed like they were absolutely out of control, it seemed like the murderous mob were the ones who had all the power and authority, but in reality, all of these events have unfolded according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, does that mean that the Jews were not culpable or responsible for the murder of Jesus? No, they were culpable and they were guilty. And so... Peter is sure to tell them, you delivered him up. It was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, but you crucified and you killed him. The fact of the matter is, any power or authority which sinful men had over Jesus was permitted by God according to his own plan to effect salvation for mankind. When Jesus stood before Pilate at his trial, he said in John 19, or Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered Pilate and said, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he delivered me over to you as the greater sin. You don't have any power over me. Any power you have that's exercised over me is power that the Father has granted to you. The apostles also recognized the fact that the crucifixion of Jesus was really Uh, taking place according to God's divine plan in Acts 4. As they prayed in Acts 4, they says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Then they said this in their prayer, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is all happening according to God's predetermined plan. And Peter would have the crowd know this. God is in control. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire human race into the depravity of sin, God has set in motion a plan to redeem his people. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3, you see uh, foreshadows of this. This is that plan that God is carrying out at this perfect time where he gives his son to accomplish salvation for all of mankind. And so Jesus accomplished all that God had sent him to do, to pay the penalty for sin and then also to make a way of reconciliation for mankind, to satisfy God's justice while also justifying those who are sinners. Jesus accomplished both of those things. Jesus bore the wrath of God against our sin. He then defeated sin's penalty by rising from the grave. In doing those things, he both satisfied the wrath and the justice of God while also making a way of escape for those who are sinners. And that, again, is what Paul alludes to in Romans 3 when he says that God became the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus while also remaining just. And so make no mistake, although Jesus' death was according to the Father's eternal plan, also recognized that Jesus Christ gave himself willingly for the world. In John chapter 10, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The Father gives his Son. The Son gives himself willingly. This is all according to God's plan. So Peter preaches, You're guilty of delivering your Messiah over to lawless men to be killed. However, do not think that Jesus was not entirely in control of his own life or that the Father was sitting idly by. All of these events are in fulfillment of thousands of years of prophecy, which God foretold. And so notice in verse 22, something else Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. What he's saying is, let's understand your guilt here. Not only have you delivered the Messiah up to die, but you've done it after God has attested to his authority and to his identity through miraculous signs and wonders. 
which he did right in front of your face. Yet with all that evidence, you still rejected him. And so understand how Peter's Holy Spirit-empowered sermon is starting to get right to the heart of these rebellious men and women. And so, as we've said, all of these events played out according to God's predetermined plan. God's plan for redemption included both the death and the resurrection of his son, and nothing would prevent that from being carried out. Next of all, what do we see? We see in Peter's sermon that the resurrection, not only determined by God from the beginning, but that it verifies the authenticity of God's word. Look in verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then what does Peter do? He appeals to the Old Testament. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made it known to me, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then Peter says, brothers, I may say to you with all confidence, David's dead. And he's buried. So who's he talking about in this psalm? This one he sees uh, upon whom Hades will have no power. The one who will not be kept in the tomb. The one who will not see corruption. Obviously, David was looking forward to somebody who would come. And so he says in verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was an impossibility for Jesus to stay dead. It was impossible for him not to be raised from the dead. And why? What is what's Peter's reasoning here? Because he's the son of God? Yes, but that's not what Peter says right here. Because uh, what? He says, because of what the word of God says, what the scriptures say. And so then he appeals to the Psalms. And look in verse 25. Peter appeals to the book of Psalms, Psalm 16. David says concerning him, Then he refers to David as a prophet. Peter's point is that not only did the events of Jesus' crucifixion unfold according to God's predetermined plan, but that Jesus' resurrection was clearly promised by God through the Scriptures. David foresaw a thousand years before Jesus that one would come of his descendants who would ascend to his throne, some Davidic king who would sit on his throne, whose reign then would be eternal. One unlike every other Davidic king, uh, one upon whom death would have no hold. And so Peter says that's what's just been fulfilled. Peter's point is that not only did the events of the crucifixion unfold according to God's plan, but also the scriptures. Peter appeals to prophecy in Psalm 16. And again, not only evidence that the resurrection was foretold, but evidence that it was impossible for it not to happen. God's predetermined plan, the Scripture's prophetic testimony, both pointed to the fact or the events of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. If Peter's audience knew God and knew his word at all, then these are things they could have known. This is not the only place that we see an appeal to the Old Testament in order to show us that God had prophesied the events of Holy Week, the Passion of Christ, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Jesus himself, in Luke chapter 24, walks down a road with two disciples on that road to Emmaus, and he opens the scriptures and shows them all the things in the Old Testament concerning himself. And so these events are foretold, and so they happened. They happened, and so they fulfilled what was foretold. It's in this way that Jesus' resurrection verifies the authenticity of God's word. But not only does Jesus' resurrection verify the authenticity of the word, but it also verifies his own words, because Jesus himself foretold of his own resurrection. John 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He's talking about his body. Matthew 16, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Matthew 26, he says, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus staked his own credibility on his resurrection. If he didn't rise from the dead, then he's a liar. And so the resurrection verifies the authenticity of God's word. It verifies the authenticity of Christ's statements and thereby Christ's identity. So Jesus set the the standard for his own authenticity as the son of God. 
and he met that standard when he rose from the dead. And so the scripture and his own statements are validated through the resurrection. The fact of the matter is, as Jared alluded to earlier, or read earlier, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the words of Jesus are false, and frankly, our entire faith is pointless. The Bible made this abundantly clear, or Paul made this abundantly clear in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. This, this exercise we're doing this morning is entirely pointless. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Christianity without the resurrection is pointless. If there's no life after death, if there is no resurrection, number one, Jesus didn't rise, which means he didn't accomplish salvation for us. But then what's the point? I mean, eat and drink and be merry, right? I mean, just live it up in this life if there's no resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then we are most men to be pitied, Paul says. A Christianity without the resurrection is heretical. It's apostate and it's pointless. No resurrection, no risen Christ. No resurrection, no preaching. It's all vain. No resurrection, then we are false witnesses. No resurrection, we're still in our sins. No resurrection, then the dead uh, who've gone on before us are all perished. No resurrection, no hope. And so, according to Peter, the resurrection of Jesus was determined by God from the beginning. The resurrection of Jesus verifies the authenticity of God's word. And next of all, he shows us that the resurrection of Jesus is central to Christianity and the absolute focus of our witness. Look in verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. What was Peter before the Holy Spirit descended? He is a weak, fickle disciple, one who betrays Jesus at the first sign of difficulty. But now because Christ has risen and he's received the Holy Spirit, he's a powerful witness. And what is his message? The resurrection. God raised him up, and of that we are all witnesses, Peter says. The fact of the matter is, if there was no resurrection, then Peter's got nothing to say. I followed Jesus, I thought he was the Messiah, and now he's dead. That's my message. But Jesus did raise. And so Peter could preach powerfully about the resurrection. Peter and the other disciples stood as witnesses of the resurrection. And to this day, the resurrection of Jesus is the only reason any of us as, of, as Christians have anything to say. This truth underpins everything else that we as Christians have to say. The disciples' encounter with Jesus after the resurrection was so powerful and so important that it was the key subject of their witness everywhere they went. In fact, do a word study. Every time you see the word witness in the New Testament, it's in reference to the disciples witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples' continual preaching of the resurrection became that persistent annoyance. The persecution they faced was because they preached the resurrection, according to Acts chapter 4. The resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of our faith. It's the supreme apex upon which all of Christianity turns. Again, to preach Jesus is to preach the resurrection. A Christian faith or a denomination without a physical, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus is apostate, it's heretical, and frankly, it's pointless. It's powerless. It's a perversion of the truth. If we have no resurrection, we have nothing. It's not surprising then that when we eavesdrop on Peter preaching to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, Peter says to that Gentile, and we are witnesses of all that he did, that Jesus did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You can fast forward, we don't have time, but you could go to Paul in Athens in Acts chapter 17 as he's preaching to those philosophers. And guess what he preaches? 
the resurrection. And so as Christians, we are witnesses of the resurrection. Because you and I have witnessed the resurrection? No. We're witnesses of the resurrection in a different way. First, we can testify to what the scriptures say about the resurrection. So certainly we're a witness that way. But we're witnesses of the resurrection in a different way as well. We have all, if you're a believer this morning, you have experienced resurrection power. Jesus saved me. And I know Jesus saved me. How? Because the Holy Spirit's present in my life. If you're a believer this morning, you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit's witness in your life. And you know it, right? You've experienced this. What does that witness look like? Does it look like an audible voice? No. It looks like the Holy Spirit transforming you to look more and more like Jesus. He's given you a love for the Lord that you didn't have before. He's given you a love for fellow believers that you didn't have before. Your heart burns within you as you hear the word of God and it challenges you and convicts you and comforts you and changes you. That's new. That's wrought by the Holy Spirit. You have an increasing distaste for the things of the world. The things you used to do, the way you used to think, the things you used to accept, they're not there anymore. Why? The Holy Spirit is making you more and more like Christ. You have that internal witness to the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. How? Because you only have the Holy Spirit because it's the spoils. He is the spoils of Christ's victory over sin, death, and Satan. And so he ascends to the Father and he bestows the Spirit. You and I are witnesses of that this morning. The only reason you're driven to prayer, the only reason you have rest in Christ, the only reason you have love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and faith and self-control and so on, the reason that's welling up inside of you is because of the Spirit whom the resurrected Christ has given. So you and I are witnesses of the new spiritual life that has been made possible only by the resurrected Jesus. If Christ were not raised, the Holy Spirit would not have been sent, and you and I would remain in our sins. You and I would not have experienced spiritual renewal. However, Christ has been raised. He has sent the Holy Spirit, and you and I have been raised from from spiritual death. Our present spiritual growth and transformation stand as witnesses to that. When Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, this is what he asked. He prayed that they might come to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, in the heavenly places. Paul's prayer was, hey, help us. We want, I want for you to come to understand resurrection power. That same power that brought Jesus from the dead is alive and working in you, and I want you to experience that more and more. That's what spiritual growth looks like. If there's no resurrection, Christianity would have died in the first century. Would have been a gathering like any other gathering. Would have been a country club. Would have been a social event. But the fact of the matter is the church was different. In response to Peter's sermon, 3,000, spoiler alert, 3,000 Jews respond to Peter's sermon and are saved. And what do those 3,000 Jews do? They receive the Holy Spirit, the church is born, and then they become committed to one another. They love one another. They behave like Jesus with one another. And that newfound community that's birthed by the Holy Spirit would serve it as an awesome witness to the reality of Christ's resurrection. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we get a glimpse of it. Those who come to believe in Jesus, it says, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The evidence of Christ's resurrection was the descent and the product of the Holy Spirit, which was the loving community of the church. Isn't this incredible? A witness to the resurrection of Jesus is how well we love one another. A witness to the resurrection and the fact that Jesus is alive is the fact that we are becoming more like Christ, especially in our relationships with one another. That's why Jesus would say in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. And what? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
the evidence that we are the followers of the risen Christ is the love we have for each other. And that way, we are witnesses of the resurrection. So, Peter preaches, the resurrection was in God's plan from the beginning. The resurrection verifies the authenticity of God's word. The resurrection is the central truth of Christianity. And then next of all, Peter preaches that the resurrection of Jesus crowns him as Lord and Christ. Look in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Set at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Then he says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I think that Peter's hearers were probably already shaking in their boots a little bit. I think they're already struck to their hearts a little bit because they're beginning to realize that the Jesus whom they crucified is alive. And if they're not trembling yet, they will now. What Peter is preaching is that Jesus not only died according to God's predetermined plan and has been resurrected according to Scripture's prophecy, but he now reigns. He now reigns as God's appointed king. Jesus is not only alive, but he's exalted. He's seated at the right hand of God, a position of power and privilege and preeminence. Further, Jesus is responsible for the events that are unfolding before their eyes. The loving fellowship of the unified disciples, the miraculous speaking in foreign languages, the spontaneous praise of God, the boldness of the disciples is all a product of the Holy Spirit. It's all produced by Jesus who sent that Spirit. What they were experiencing in that moment was that incontrovertible proof that Jesus was not only alive, but he was reigning. That's scary stuff when you look in verse 34, and it said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If you're responsible for calling for the crucifixion of Jesus or sitting idly by, assenting to that death, and you hear Peter say that he's reigning until his enemies are made his footstool, you might be saying, "Uh uh-oh, because I have made myself his enemy. The meek Messiah has become the risen Lord, and he has power now to act as the conquering king. And so as Paul would later say, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that now in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're here this morning and you're wondering, okay, it all sounds fine and good, but how do I get saved? How do I know that I have eternal life? What's my response? Well, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why must we confess the risen Christ as Lord? Because his resurrection guarantees not only that he's exalted at the right hand of God, but it also guarantees that he is going to return once again as judge. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 says that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance. How? By raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees the fact that he's going to come back again next time as judge. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Christ's resurrection guarantees the fact that we all must stand before him, or we all must face him as judge. You can be assured of that because he's alive. And so Christ rose. He was not resuscitated to die again. He did not swoon on the cross and then be placed into a tomb just to uh, revive again. He was resurrected. He was dead for three days, and he returned to life. This confirms, affirms his deity, his identity as a son of God, and the reality that he's going to return as judge. So, Christ is the only risen Lord. He's the only one to whom men owe their allegiance. Christianity claims exclusivity in that, in that, yes, you can see a lot of similarities with different religions, 
oh, love one another and be kind to one another and believe in a superior being and so on. You see a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels with different religions. You know what Christianity has that no other religion has? Has the risen Christ. Peter and John communicated this in Acts 4. After healing a lame man in the power of Jesus, let it be known to, to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man standing before you is standing before you well. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the exclusivity of Christianity, and it's rooted in the resurrection. And so we learn that Peter's message at Pentecost is all about the resurrection. But what we see next, and we're going to close with this, what we see next is that Peter was not just giving a theological lecture. And that's not what I'm doing this morning. Take all this information and stuff it into your brain. That's not what's happening. Peter's message at Pentecost was all about the resurrection, and it demanded a response. We could say that this message this morning that we're sharing demands a response. And let's look at that response. And this is our last point, and we see that Peter preaches that the resurrection of Jesus demands repentance from all men. Look in verse 37. Now when they, the crowd, heard this, heard everything we just said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They're convicted. They see their guilt. They see their need. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That's an awesome response. They understood that what they heard demanded a verdict. It demanded a response. And now they're, they're, they're kind of panicking in their spot, saying, okay, how do we respond? What do you want us to do now? And there's, a re- there's an answer. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And so Peter's sermon has its intended effect, as does every sermon empowered by the Holy Spirit. God used the preaching of the resurrection of Jesus to convict the crowd and to lead them to see their need for salvation. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Turn from your sin. Repent of your sin. Turn from your rejection of Christ. Repent and be baptized in his name. As we've already stated this morning, to be baptized in his name means to take the name of Jesus upon yourself. Whereas previously they were cursing the name of Jesus, now Peter is saying, turn, repent, take his name upon yourself and identify with him. It means to take his name upon yourself. It means to identify with Jesus. It means to trust Jesus alone as Savior and Lord. It means to confess him and him alone as one's personal Savior. In other words, repent of your sin and become a disciple or follower of Jesus. And so Peter even tells his audience what the response will be from God when one repents of their sin and places their trust in Jesus, in verse 38. For the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Identify with him and trust him as Savior and Lord. What's going to happen? Your sins will be forgiven. We're all sinners this morning. There's a mix here this morning, I'm assuming, of Christians and non-Christians. And can we divide into Christian and non-Christian? I think we can, but we cannot divide sinner and non-sinner because we're all sinners. The difference this morning is there are some who have seen the need to come to Jesus for salvation and their sins have been forgiven. Still sinners, still absolutely unworthy of salvation, but have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding they need for that forgiveness. And there's others here this morning who are still in their sins. The forgiveness of sins, that's what the Lord gives to those who trust his Son. And what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just forgiveness, like here's a clean slate. There you go, try again. That's not what's happening here. The forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is something entirely new. The Spirit comes to dwell inside. It makes you spiritually regenerated. Regeneration, new life. And then what? The Holy Spirit abides with you for the rest of your earthly life. 
slowly using God's means to make you more and more like Jesus. And now what? You can actually please God in a way you could never please Him before in your flesh. In fact, the Bible says that when we walk according to the Spirit, we actually fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. So we can actually please Him in a way we couldn't before. Spiritual new birth. That's the product of repentance and faith in Jesus. What an incredible gift. What incredible gifts. What unmatchable blessings. Forgiveness and the Spirit. And these are exclusively for those who believe in Jesus as the resurrected Christ. And that offer is open to all of us this morning. So in conclusion, we started out by saying that Christ's opponents were concerned that the disciples might steal the body of Jesus. Then start rumors about the resurrection. It's kind of amusing to see that their efforts to stop Christianity from blowing up into what it is, their efforts to stop that was to roll a stone in front of the tomb, put a wax seal on it, and put two guards there. In God's providence, however, God arranged for the powerful descent of the Holy Spirit. Not only did he raise Jesus from the dead, but the Holy Spirit came and empowered his people, made a brand new loving community of believers in Jesus, and no wax seal on a tomb was going to stop that. In God's providence, God arranged for these events to take place when thousands of Jews were present on the day of Pentecost. Then with that massive audience, he sends the Holy Spirit with outward undeniable signs so that all men heard the mighty works of God spoken in their own tongues. Beyond this, the crowds would be astonished by the powerful preaching of those uneducated, formerly timid men. These Holy Spirit-empowered words would penetrate right to their hearts, and they, overcome with guilt and convinced of their need for Jesus Christ, would them, they themselves bow the knee to Jesus, confessing Him as Lord. If the corrupt religious leaders or the civil authorities thought they might be able to keep a lid on this thing, all that hope is lost. Christ is risen. He's Lord of all to the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. All that he sends his Holy Spirit to do will be accomplished. And so now as we close, look at verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And here we are 2,000 years later. The Spirit is still making disciples, as we saw this morning. He's still convincing men of the gospel. He's still transforming skeptics and sinners, the fearful and the lost, into faith-filled followers who have the resurrection on their lips, and boldly proclaim the gospel for all to hear. So this morning, if you're not a believer, that offer is open to you. Repent and believe in Jesus. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, He will transform you. He will bring spiritual life. And then you're going to walk with Jesus the whole rest of your life, slowly becoming more and more like him. Are you worthy of that? No. Neither are any any, any of us. If you're a Christian this morning, be assured that your sins are forgiven. The Holy Spirit is present in your life. Walk with Him. Uh, Continue to be a witness of the resurrection through the spoken word, yes, but also a witness through your own transformed life and what? Really how you live out that discipleship in this covenant community we have this morning. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank You for Jesus. And this was a lot of content this morning, a lot to be said as we looked at Peter's sermon, and we just pray that the Holy Spirit would use some of it in in our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would assure uh, believers, unbelievers this morning that Jesus loves them and died for them on the cross, that he's calling them to himself, and that call just looks like a call to repent and to believe. So we pray that these would receive Jesus, that they would be saved, trusting him as Savior and Lord. And then for those of us who are Christians this morning, Lord, we confess our unworthiness. We believe not because we are better than others, not because we're more intelligent, not because we're more moral. This has nothing to do with our worthiness. It's all your mercy and your grace. And so those of us who are Christians this morning, help us. Number one, to glory in what Jesus has done for us, but also to understand that through his resurrection, he's provided resurrection power. His Holy Spirit works in us to transform us. So help us to pursue that spiritual growth. 
Help us to proclaim the gospel to others and then help us to live out the gospel with one another in the church. And we pray that the community of Calvary Baptist Church would be a wonderful, shining example of the power of the gospel, the reality of the resurrection, because we love one another as Christ has commanded us. We pray you bless that way and bring forth fruit from the preaching of Peter's sermon. Lord, we thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.